Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I hope you're doing all right. I've had a bit of a rough week myself. I've had really agonizing toothache, but thankfully that's all been sorted out with some antibiotics. So I'm right as rain and looking forward to spending this time with you. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I'd arrived in America. I was presently in a taxi cab, wondering what the hell I'd done. Coming here to the land of the great and the land of the plenty had been an off-the-cuff decision that hadn't required much sagacious thought on my part. A distant cousin of mine on my father's side of the family, who had, I'd never had the privilege to actually meet, had spontaneously agreed to engage in an apartment swap with me for over six months. My father had told me not to look a gift horse in the mouth, to say yes to this temporary exchange. This was the quintessential opportunity that I couldn't afford to miss, he had assured me. It'll do you good, sweetheart, experiencing life in another country. I will cover all your expenses for the next six months. How about that? My father was a man of great wisdom and insight, so I had listened to him diligently. I knew he was absolutely right. I was about 24 at the time, with a desire to one day run my own cafe in London, where I would provide coffee and sandwiches for those desiring a light snack or a quick bite to eat. I had enrolled in a six-month cookery course in Seattle that was starting in a week's time. I would be learning the secrets to fine French cuisine under the culinary guidance and expertise of the accomplished master chef Jules Toussaint. It was ironic that I was learning from a French master in America rather than in Paris, but there we go. Stranger things have indeed happened, but little did I realise the next few days of my life were about to get exceedingly strange. We had made this impetuous, impromptu decision an entire week ago. My cousin would be moving into my living quarters in London, and I would be moving into his illustrious condo in Seattle. But I'd never met him, so in effect I was moving into a stranger's accommodation, and vice versa. I'd warned him that my unpretentious abode in London was cosy, cheerful and homely, but it wasn't grandiose or extravagant in any way. It was a one-bedroom penthouse with a tiny, very well-equipped kitchenette, living area, dining room and bathroom. Very small but quaint. But the best part about it was it was centrally located in Bayswater. Bayswater is a very cosmopolitan, multicultural part of London. A buzzing, energetic metropolis with vibrant, colourful streets full of brisk, bustling pedestrians, black London taxi cabs, red London buses, restaurants, food shops and apartments. On the outside, the apartments in the large white Georgian building where I lived were very ornate and expensive to look at. The architecture was exceedingly impressive, with pediments, columns and arches, and you could be forgiven for believing that the flats contained therein were very ostentatious, but nothing could be further from the truth, as the interiors were pretty standard. Needless to say, I had successfully managed to make my home into an expression of myself, sumptuous, snug, colourful and congenial. I discerned that my cousin's apartment, from what I could gather, was in a very grandiose, opulent apartment block that looked flamboyant, as it did theatrical, from the pictures my cousin had actually sent me. I was doing exceedingly well on this deal. My father was American, but this was the first time I'd ever visited his homeland. I remember as a child growing up in England, whenever England and America were caught up in sports games together, there would be conflict in our household between my mother and my dad over the sports in question, which was a real joke, as my mother was as interested in sports as a rabbit would be interested in a filet mignon. I think my mother just loved to ruffle my father's feathers, teasing him mercilessly. England is going to win, she'd say. England is going to win. While my father would swear a devoted, undivided allegiance to America. Nonsense! America's going to win! America's going to win! My mother would give me a huge teasing wink, knowing full well she'd achieved the desired effect on my father, who was getting heated under the collar. She loved working him up into a lather. In truth, although she was British, she didn't give a toss whether England lost to America or not, but she loved winding my poor father up. 
Of course, I was supposed to be neutral, like Switzerland, not getting involved in any way, as my father always reminded me that I was half American, a fact that I was never allowed to forget, not even for a single moment. You may sound and even look like the quintessential English rose, dear, with your fair peachy skin, dark hair and blue eyes. But don't ever forget, half the blood running through your veins, Arabella, is American. So you're an English rose with an exotic American touch. I'd always liked the sound of that. What woman wouldn't appreciate being called exotic? It left the girl next door look flying out of the window, made me appear mysterious, exciting. Not that I was either one of those, of course. But now I was in America, sitting in this taxi cab, as the taxi driver drove through the streets of Seattle, while the pelting rain thrashed against the windscreen. I noticed his windscreen wipers were working vigorously to push away the sloshing droplets of water that bespeckled the glass. It didn't help that the gridlock frenzied traffic was really quite hectic, with despairing, frustrated drivers honking their horns and patience running thin. I had expected my taxi driver to be an all-American man, but he looked like he was from the Middle East, with that yellow skin tone, very prominent lips, a sloped forehead, a larger bridge on the nose, and a less prominent tip on the chin. He was wearing a bright orange turban, sporting a white moustache, thicker on one side than on the other reminding me of many of the foreigners I encountered on the streets of Bayswater, where there's a thriving, somewhat blossoming Arab community. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised, as Seattle was also a cosmopolitan city. Is it always raining like this here in Seattle? I asked the driver curiously. It's very changeable here. We're known for having three seasons in one day. It can pour with rain, and the next minute the sun comes out, just like that. Here in Seattle... We can wear a sweater, a coat, a sundress and a raincoat in one day. That's how changeable the seasons are. I gather from what I've heard it rains a lot in England. Is that right? Yes, it rains a lot there. We even get rather bad flooding at times that can wreak havoc on people's homes. Personally, I've never been adverse to the rain. A lot of people are, but not me. I like how fresh it makes everything. Me too agreed the taxi driver. But around here, the rain doesn't stop people driving atrociously. I mean, look at them. But then, who am I to complain? I'm from Cairo in Egypt, you see. People there drive like reckless maniacs, worse than here. You'll find traffic congestion building up in the road, as two people hold everybody else up, engaging in a personal dispute, like a brother having a huge altercation with his next-door neighbour about the family chickens and they'll stand there pointing accusatory fingers at each other while the traffic congestion mounts up behind them. I call it roadside drama myself. Forget your soaps on television. The live soaps on the streets of Cairo are certainly worth watching. The honking horns there, they never stop. You can hear them at three o'clock in the morning. It's insane. So however bad the traffic is here in Seattle, I shouldn't complain. I should be grateful for small mercies, however small they may seem. Here we are, said the taxi, veering his taxi to the right and making a swift turn, driving towards this incredible 19th century looking apartment block with Italianite Tuscan architectural influences. Only instead of being built on three stories in the usual way, it towered into many stories to create an impressive high rise apartment block with overhanging eaves, gentle sloping roofs, decorated by brackets, cornices, a square cupola and porches topped with balustrades. There was a very grand, large central courtyard of brick and limestone, elegantly embraced by a huge, highly ornamental fountain, where volumes of water cascaded into the air in white ribbons of foam. There were lemon trees growing from large terracotta pots, and pergolas filled with native climbing plants. Then there were plant borders on the outer perimeters, framed by geometrical hedges, where white roses intermingled rambunctiously with evergreen foliage, in greys, silvers, bronzes and golds, and there was a scattering of small ornamental trees that had been pristinely manicured. The taxi drove through the fabulously ornate, highly stylized black wrought iron gates, parking under a large mature oak tree, with a sweeping outstretched bough that created a canopy above our heads. I climbed out of the taxi, grabbing my suitcase from the trunk, and possibly paying the taxi driver far more than I should have done, but I wasn't sure what the going rates were, so it was far better to be safe than sorry. 
I made my way through the courtyard into the foyer, where I was greeted by the concierge in reception, who managed the comings and goings of all the apartments. He was a man in his early fifties, whose tanned golden brown skin wore the evidence of old acne pigmentation, but he was exceedingly handsome in a rugged sort of way, with warm congenial brown eyes, and a crooked nose that looked like it had taken a beating during a punch-up. I wondered what had happened to him. "'How may I help you, madam?' he asked. "'My name is Arabella,' I told him. "'I'm staying here in Henry Thomas's apartment.' "'Oh, that's right. The girl from England. Henry told me all about you.' He handed me the keys to Henry's penthouse. "'It's number 42, the seventh floor on the north wing,' he informed me. "'I'll get the doorman to bring up your luggage for you.' "'That's not necessary,' I said. "'My suitcase has got wheels. "'I can take it up myself in the elevator. "'It'll be a breeze, I promise.' "'If you're sure.' "'I am. "'Thanks for offering, though. "'It's very chivalrous of you.' "'It's only a pleasure,' he said, "'casting me a huge white smile of teeth. "'I took the escalator up to the seventh floor. "'I began to search for flat number 42. "'It couldn't be that hard, surely. "'As I neared my approach,' A long, thin, willowy woman with skin so delicate, it looked like fragile crepe paper covering her scowl very tightly, giving her a haunted, ghostly appearance, seemed to be hammering her fists on the door of flat number 41, which must have been next to mine. She was shouting through the door, "'Sabrina, are you there? Please answer me!' I noticed her white face looked distraught. She looked up at me with a worried, overwrought expression on her face. "'Sorry, I don't mean to intrude, nor do I mean to be a bother,' she asked me as I walked past her carrying my suitcase, stopping dead in my tracks to acknowledge the woman. "'But you haven't seen Sabrina anywhere, have you? I've been trying desperately to get hold of her. She hasn't been answering her cell phone for three days, nor has she turned up for work. Everyone is worried sick. I can't fathom what on earth has happened to her.' I could see the woman's eyes were very shiny, as her eyelashes were glistening with tears. She was visibly very upset. Look, I don't live here. I don't know, Sabrina, but from what you're telling me, you should call the police. You say it's out of character for her not to be in touch. Absolutely, said the woman. Sabrina's always exceedingly punctual. When she says she'll be at a place, she always is. I speak to her every day on my cell, but she hasn't returned any of my calls. It's not like her. I'm worried sick. She's my best friend. Has she been depressed recently? "'Behaving distant and withdrawn?' I asked. "'The woman looked at me in surprise. "'Are you suggesting my friend is suicidal?' she asked me. "'No, I'm just running through all the possibilities and options. "'Why people tend to go missing,' I said. "'Depression can make people wander off sometimes, "'do strange, rather incongruous things. "'No, she's definitely not depressed. "'She's one of the most positive people I know. "'She doesn't take drugs or narcotics by any chance? "'No. "'Well, then you must call the police.' "'because if you can tick off all those boxes, "'you know something's seriously wrong with her. "'I can wait with you, if you like, while you call them. "'No, that's very kind of you. "'I'll be fine,' said the woman. "'I can see you need to get back home. "'You've obviously got a suitcase. "'You must have been somewhere.' "'I was relieved the woman didn't accept my offer to stick around. "'I was shattered after the long trip. "'I opened the door of my apartment, "'twisting the keys in the lock. "'I had an ominous sick feeling in my gut.' that the woman in next door's apartment called Sabrina was possibly more than likely dead. How I knew this, I don't know, but I did. I was so tired, so exhausted, that when I got into my cousin's apartment, I decided to take a quick nap. But I appeared to sleep for many hours. I recall waking up at night, seeing flashing blue lights across the wall, like you'd expect to see with police cars. But due to my dreadful jet lag, along with the differing time zones, I was far too zonked to pay any attention to them at all. I'm almost sure I heard authoritative voices during the night. The following morning I was pretty certain that the blue lights I'd observed in a semi-conscious state were in fact real. There was a sinking feeling in my gut that would not abate. I was certain that the woman from next door's apartment was almost certainly dead, that the blue lights I'd seen belonged to the police. Imagine if she'd been murdered, that I'd come to America to move into an apartment next to a crime scene. It was like something out of a gripping Agatha Christie novel. My cousin's condo in Seattle was absolutely stunning, with huge floor-to-ceiling glass windows, overlooking exquisite waterfront views, where I could see boats gliding over the silvery lake, large sails blowing wistfully in the wind against a cloudless cobalt-blue sky, while the lake appeared to twinkle and sparkle 
as a golden ethereal light seemed to dance above its glittering surface, while tall statuesque trees rose up in the sky proudly, gathered together in congenial groups like old friends. There were areas of verdant manicured turf, long ribbons of paved walkways fringed the outer edges of the lake. It was very beguiling. My cousin's apartment definitely overshadowed mine in every conceivable way, which made me feel very embarrassed about my humble little abode in Bayswater. Still, my cousin knew exactly what he was getting when he signed up for this arrangement. By all accounts, his email to me affirmed that he was very pleased with the place. It read, Arrived at your beautiful flat. So cosy and warm. I'm thoroughly going to enjoy it here. LOL. I replied, Arrived at your apartment safe and well. Very ornate. I think I did the best out of this deal. LOL. I glanced at the clock. I thought it must be terribly wrong. I had perceived it was morning, but it was late afternoon of the following day. I'd obviously been completely knackered, worn out from my long trip. The block-out blinds and windows hadn't helped. They made the apartment seem so dark, so I'd falsely assumed it was morning. In truth, I felt as if I could curl up in a ball and sleep for an entire week, so I was ever grateful that there were a few days left before I started my French cookery course. I decided to make myself a cup of tea in the kitchen and put the bright red kettle on the hob. I was so glad to see my cousin had brought me some tea. There was a post-it note saying, I know how you Brits love your cuppa. There was also a large tin of mixed cookies from a chocolate chip to cinnamon and raisin. I made myself a hot cup of tea and dumped my cookie in the warm liquid. It was delicious. The chocolate in the chocolate chip cookie melted on my tongue. I briefly glanced around the apartment that had been painted in a flattering ivory tone, while the walls were aligned with this impressive collection of contemporary artwork that was full of texture, colour and depth. I was compelled to run my hands across some of the paintings to feel the ridges and lines, an enjoyable, tactile experience for me. In the hallway there was a vast collection of black and white photographs of interesting faces that I didn't know or recognise, but I imagined they were family members on my father's side that I had not been privy to meet yet. I could see the familiar family features in the picture. I wondered if any of them were pictures of my cousin. I didn't have a clue what he looked like. The apartment looked like an interior designer had been given free reign to transform this large man cave into a very glamorous-looking penthouse that would even impress the Sultan of Brunei. That is, if he chose to go for something sophisticated, but not too palatial as it really was first class, furnished with a combination of rococo and classic furnishings, which made the apartment both elegant and tasteful, but not too over the top. The only thing lacking in the apartment was any evidence of my cousin's soul, which I thought was a dreadful pity. I've always believed your home should reflect your personality, that you should put your own personal stamp on a place. There were no personal touches to this home that told me anything about my cousin other than a sweeping collection of Dick Francis and Agatha Christie novels in the bookshelves, so he liked detective novels like I did. He had expensive taste, appreciated modern art, enjoyed classical music, judging by his collection there. But other than that, I knew nothing about him. As I was pondering over this in reflective thought, the doorbell suddenly rang. I ambled over quickly to the door, looking through the peephole. I could see it was a police officer, that unfortunately didn't bear any resemblance to the famous fictional detective Hercule Poirot, which I thought was a pity. In truth, I can't say I was remotely surprised to see a police officer standing there in the door. Part of me was expecting a visit from the police, given that the woman next door had appeared to have gone missing. I was beginning to feel like I was playing an exciting part in one of those gripping, spellbinding movies, like Murder on the Orient Express. The only problem the police were not going to put me down as a potential suspect, as it would have been an impossibility for me to have committed a murder, as I was flying over the Atlantic at the time. A small part of me almost fantasised about being a potential suspect, the police whispering among themselves, could it be the exotic English girl, guilty of this heinous crime? Hello, said the police officer standing in the doorway looking at me. I'm Officer Howard Posner. May I come in? He was a very congenial man, with a soft, Southern American drawl, which I found attractive. He was easy on the eye, with a bright smile of whiter-than-white teeth, and brown piercing eyes that were so discerning they reminded me of an eagle's. But then you did have to be astute, discriminating and insightful to be an officer on the force, surely. 
Of course, I said, inviting the officer into the flat, gesturing for him to sit down on an upholstered chair, which he did so, but he sat on the very edge, looking authoritative, very businesslike. I'm investigating the homicide of a young woman called Sabrina Cooper Fox, who lived in the apartment next door to yours. We are here to make inquiries in the apartment block to establish her last known whereabouts. We are naturally interviewing everyone in the entire building, but you are her most immediate neighbour, so I'm hoping you may remember the last time you saw her, and whether she was alone or had company. Oh, my word! So the girl next door is dead. I thought as much. It was a gut instinct. I'm afraid so, said the officer, stroking his chin reflectively. Did you know Sabrina personally? Or were you just passing acquaintances? No, officer, I don't know her at all. I only landed in America yesterday morning, courtesy of London Heathrow Airport. You see, when I arrived at the apartments, I saw an exceptionally thin young woman, frantically trying to get into Sabrina's apartment. She said she hadn't seen or heard from Sabrina for over three days, nor had she turned up for work. I immediately suspected that to be rather suspicious, so I encouraged her to phone the police at once. I'm presently doing a six-month apartment swap with a cousin of mine, so he's staying in my apartment in Bayswater in London, and I'm staying here in this one in Seattle. I'm here to do a six-month cookery course, you see, as my father was eager for me to come to America. He's American. I wish I could help you, officer, but I know absolutely nothing about Sabrina. I see, said the officer. So your cousin would have known Sabrina then. What was his name? His name is Henry Thomas, but I don't know him personally. Actually, we've never met before. But yes, if he lived next door to Sabrina, I imagine they must have at least known each other in passing, surely. The officer's face paled to a ghostly white, as if all the colour had faded from his face. His pronounced masculine jawline stiffened, his slender muscular body visibly straightened rather reminding me of an alert dog that had sensed a curious noise and its ears had stood up and become unduly guarded, very tense. You say your cousin's name is Henry Thomas? Is that right? That's right. I have a report that he was the last person to be seen with Sabrina alive. I gather they were in a serious relationship together. Everyone here in the apartment block recognises them as a couple. I was under the distinct impression he lived close to Sabrina, but I had no idea he lived in the flat next door. That is most interesting. You see, you are being very informative and most helpful. This time it was my turn to look astonished. She was going out with my cousin? Are you being serious? I am afraid so. Do you have his cell phone number? asked the officer. As you will appreciate under the circumstances, I really do need to contact him ASAP. Of course, I'll give you all his contact details. Is he a suspect in the murder? Sorry, stupid me. A funny question to ask, I know. I've watched enough crime scene dramas to know that people closest to the victim are always considered suspects. Well, he will need to be helping us with our inquiries. Would you mind if I do a quick search of the apartment? Be my guest, officer. I've got nothing to hide. I only hope my cousin doesn't, but you're welcome to look around. Well, if you prefer, I could organise a search warrant. That's not necessary. You go ahead and search. Did you find anything of interest, I asked him, after he'd finished his brisk search of the place? No. The apartment is spotless, rather like a hotel. Not much personal stuff around. My thoughts exactly. That's what I thought when I got here. Here's my card. Give me a call if anything unusual grabs your attention. I would most appreciate it. We'll do so, I said. After the officer had left, I gathered my purse in my hand, threw on a pair of jeans, a sweater and sneakers. I noticed the building was full of police officers knocking on doors, asking the residents questions. It was hard to get my head around the fact that the girl in the next door apartment had been murdered. Worse still, she'd been dating my cousin. Was it possible that my cousin could have murdered her? The police were more than a little keen to interview him. I knew nothing about my cousin. For all I knew, he could be a psychopath. All these thoughts were whirling around my mind, taunting me, as I enjoyed a brief walk around the waterfront, with the full intention of buying a few groceries at the local store. Lake Washington was exceedingly beautiful. Many people were out taking casual runs or strolls around the lake.
while some young women were out with strollers walking their babies. I found the perfect convenience store on the street corner, where I gathered some essential supplies, namely some delicious baked bread, American cheddar cheese, ham, along with a couple of bottles of white wine, and then I made the trip back home, walking all the way, with the full intention of taking it easy for the next couple of days, until I acclimatised. I'd drink wine, watch television, as I noticed my cousin had over a hundred channels to choose from. It was on Thursday when there was a knock at the door. I opened it and there was a young man standing in the doorway, who bore an uncanny resemblance to my father, so much so that I physically gawped. The man had my father's handsome warm olive complexion, bright green brown eyes, a distinctive square jawline, a prominent nose. He also had my father's thick brown curly locks. He was dressed in a smart pair of Levi jeans with a sweatshirt that read London Rocks, which I assume he must have only just purchased when he arrived in London. Hello, Arabella. I'm your cousin, Henry Thomas. It's so good to finally meet you. What are you doing here? Please don't tell me that my flat was so bad in London that you just couldn't hack it and you took the next flight home. I truly didn't think it was as bad as that. No, nothing like that. Nothing could be further from the truth. I was informed by the police that they would appreciate my flying home as quickly as possible to answer some of their police inquiries. So I hope you don't mind me occupying the spare room while you're here. I'm shattered. I would appreciate you not telling the police I'm here yet. I told them I'd be home in a week. Of course, I said. I shan't say a single thing. I do understand how you feel. I'm still recovering from my long-haul flight myself. But you... You, with two long-haul flights behind you, you must be completely plastered. Tell me about it. I don't know how those pilots do it. He said, flying over such long distances. I can't imagine what it does to your body clock. I left my cousin to sleep and went to the local shops again to buy some groceries. I had decided I'd make my cousin a traditional English favourite, toad in the hole with gravy. Something smells delicious, said my cousin, entering the kitchen later on in the evening greeted to the smells of sizzling sausage. I hope you're hungry. I've made toad in the hole. What's that? Sausages cooked in batter, served with gravy. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. It's really yummy. Men particularly love it, because I suppose it's quite stodgy, really. We ate our meal together in silence, while my cousin made some audible appreciative sounds as he ate. This is delicious. I poured my cousin a large glass of wine as I decided to broach the subject of Sabrina's death. Should I tread cautiously, I wondered, when broaching the subject? How was he affected by it? He seemed all right to me. I'm really sorry about what happened to Sabrina. I gather she was your girlfriend, that you were in a serious relationship together. You must be very upset about what happened. My cousin did seem to tear up. She was the love of my life. Oh, I'm so sorry, I said, reaching out my hand to touch my cousin's arm. This can't be easy for you. It must have come as a dreadful, horrifying shock to learn about her unfortunate demise. I'm not sure how she died, but the police are treating it as a homicide. I know all about that, from what I gleaned from the police. Can I tell you something, in the strictest confidence, Sabrina? I need to tell someone this, but I don't want you to go blabbing to the police under any circumstances. Go on, I said. Try me. I'm a good listener. I was crossing my fingers and toes secretly, fully aware that if he told me something explosive, I would be forced to go to the police, especially if my cousin was involved in Sabrina's murder. The horrifying thought sent shivers down my spine. I knew absolutely nothing about my cousin, who was eating dinner with me. He could be anyone, a serial killer for all I knew. Of course, he didn't look like one, but I had learned one thing in life. Appearances can be deceptive and not all is what it seems. I know why Sabrina died. It wasn't a homicide. Well, it was, and it wasn't. Why don't you talk to the police about it, then, I asked. Are you crazy? They need to know exactly what happened. You don't want them going pinning the crime on you, especially if you had nothing to do with it. It's not as plain sailing as that. If it was, I would have told them what happened a long time ago. But it's complicated. I gasped. "'You know about Sabrina's death?' I asked, looking at him in astonishment. "'You knew about it before you flew to England. "'Why the heck didn't you tell someone?' "'As I was saying, it's not that straightforward. "'I was scared. 
So then what happened? I asked my steely gaze fixing on my cousin. Sabrina and I decided to go rambling on this woodland trail. Outside Seattle. We love to go walking, exploring and adventuring. We are keen, outdoorsy people. That weekend was no exception. We left our apartments in Seattle at about four o'clock in the morning, so that we could start our hike relatively early. We've always found early morning walks most agreeable, very invigorating. When we arrived at the hiking trail, we were the only car in the parking lot, which came as no surprise to us, given the time. We gathered our belongings from the trunk, which included light backpacks containing drinks, snacks and a few other odds and ends. The sun was beginning to set over the horizon. Before long, the first beams of morning sunshine danced through the ponderosa pines and Douglas firs. The smell of the forest at the time of the morning was incredulous. It smelt like butterscotch. Very pleasant. We were greeted to the sounds of the dawn chorus. The bird song that filtered over the valley was magnificent. Being up so early, we encountered quite a lot of animal life. A lone fox crossed our path, looking at us curiously. He was a spectacular specimen, I have to say. Then we scared off a few deer. It was as we were walking my girlfriend heard the strange, chattering sound. It was curiously bizarre. It sounded exactly like a monkey, but as you can appreciate, we don't have monkeys here in America. But that is the only way I can describe the sound to you. Sabrina loves every kind of animal. She's animal crazy. She got very excited as she followed the sound. There, perched on the tree, was a tiny creature, about the size of a small monkey. It looked like a human covered in hair, but it did have a primate-like look to it. We had no idea what it was, but it was terribly friendly towards us and very affectionate towards Sabrina. She couldn't help but pick it up, hold it in her arms, bobbing it up and down on her hips like a baby. She was making those, oh, isn't he so cute, expressions with her face, and saying, oh my God, he's the most adorable thing that I've ever seen in my entire life. The critter was making these appreciative, chattering sounds. It was even nibbling Sabrina's ear. It was so, so sweet. I think it might be abandoned. We should definitely take it home with us. The creature was loving the fuss that Sabrina was giving him. He was playing with her long hair, pulling it, and Sabrina was laughing. Sabrina looked hopelessly smitten, looking at me with those puppy dog eyes. I put my foot down about her keeping the strange creature. We began to argue about it. I don't believe it's abandoned, I insisted. I think this creature is waiting in the tree for its mother. As if on cue, with seemingly impeccable timing, we heard this god-awful noise. The only way I can describe it to you was that something was thundering through the wood grove. It sounded like a rhino was bounding towards us. Everything heaved, groaned and vibrated under its feet. It happened so quickly, far too quickly for us to react. Almost like a road traffic accident. It was unavoidable, inescapable, unfathomable. Then there she was, a Bigfoot. The creature was absolutely enormous. And when I say enormous, I can't justify the word enormous strongly enough. Perhaps the word gargantian and titanic would be more appropriate words to describe her size. I would easily estimate she was between eight and nine foot tall, possibly 700 pounds or more, because that's being conservative. I've never seen such well-defined shoulders before, such an incredibly impressive ripped torso. I wouldn't mind one like that myself. The creature was all muscle, brawn, power and might. She was covered from head to toe with dark brown hair, the colour of a black bear. The creature's face was remarkably human. She had very full, large breasts, which suggested to me she was breastfeeding, so it was clear she was definitely a female. When she saw Sabrina with her baby, she was furious, reacting, I suppose, like a protective mother would. She lifted her thin lips back to reveal these very large, human-like teeth. Then she began to growl her belligerent eyes focusing directly on Sabrina. She then pushed Sabrina back with a powerful hand, which caused her to fall backwards onto the ground with an almighty thud. I don't think that Bigfoot female had any concept of how powerful she was. I mean, a slap from her with one of her hands is possibly equivalent to being slammed across the head with a baseball bat. The creature looked down on Sabrina. 
who by this time was lying flat on the ground. He spoke to her in this language. I'm not sure what she said, but if I was to guess, I would say she was saying, leave me alone, leave my kid alone. I could see she was heartily distressed, a mother who potentially saw Sabrina as a threat. I mean, the way Sabrina was looking at the baby, you could tell she wanted to keep it for herself. That wasn't a good look. Possibly the creature picked up that energy from her. The creature glanced at me briefly only for a second. I did see a mother's loving eyes that looked flustered, upset, exceedingly protective. The creature turned around, gliding away, with her baby perched on her hips. I ran over to Sabrina, who was lying across the ground looking rather dazed, confused and light-headed. She managed to get up, although she hobbled awkwardly. She claimed that her head was really throbbing and pounding, and that she had a violent headache. There was a bit of blood coming out of the side of her head. She said that the hands of the creature swiped her so hard, she was surprised that her head didn't go flying off her neck. She was so horrible lashing out at me like that. I was concerned about Sabrina, so I decided to go home. But I told her I thought it was a good idea for us to check into the hospital first, to ensure that she was all right. But she assured me she was absolutely fine. It hadn't been too hard a hit. But I wasn't so sure. I wish I had listened to my gut, but I didn't. I felt that she was more injured than she actually was. We live in apartments next to each other, as you know. Sabrina told me she wanted to go to bed early, as she had a splitting headache. So I gave her some Advil. The next morning when I went to check on her, she was dead. As you can imagine, I just couldn't believe it. I was completely devastated. I still am, but I'm rather numb at the moment, so I'm not really feeling anything right now. I'm still in shock. But I blame myself for not taking her to the hospital. I'm certain she could have been saved. Obviously, it was the injury to the head that caused her demise. Oh my God! Why didn't you call the police? This is nonsensical. It's crazy. And say what? Oh, by the way, my girlfriend was thrashed by a Bigfoot. I mean, let's get real. Are they ever going to believe my story? I ascertain that she must have a blow to the head. I realise that it could be considered a homicide. Anyone could have potentially done it. I would be the most likely candidate to be blamed for the murder, because I was close to Sabrina. She was my girlfriend. I mean, the coroner is going to say her death is a probable homicide, as she had obtained blunt force injury to the head. I know how these detective novels work. I read enough of them. But running away to London, it makes you look guilty. Well, what was I to do? I can't exactly tell the police what I told you. People are ridiculed for believing in Bigfoot. Well, why don't you say she was attacked by a bear? You think I could have said that? My cousin asked. I'm not so sure. Absolutely. Look, I'll do a Google search. Listen to this. When a bear attacks a human, it's likely to go directly for the face or head. It might be advisable to play dead in the circumstances in order for the bear to see the threat as having gone away and to leave you alone. If you continue to fight back, you're likely to fight a losing battle. Be very wary of going near mother bears and cubs. Don't you see what you can say? Sabrina was throttled over the head by a bear, played dead. Tell them everything you told me, but replace the baby Bigfoot with a bear cub and a Bigfoot mother with a mother bear. Explain to them that you panicked when you saw she was dead, thinking you would be blamed for the homicide. To cut a long story short, when my cousin was taken in for questioning by the police, he took my advice, told them everything, omitting the fact that the critter that had thrashed him was a Bigfoot. He explained that he was scared because he felt he'd be accused of the murder. It was very fortunate that my cousin's story was confirmed, as Sabrina had left a voice message for her mother that her mother had overlooked. It said, Hi, Mum, it's me. I'm not feeling too great. I'm in bed right now. I was hit on the head by a hairy creature today in the woods. I'll tell you all about it when I see you. I was playing with her cub. Got a throbbing headache as a result. But we'll phone you in the morning when I'm feeling better. I think Sabrina must have been rather reluctant to divulge to her own mother that she had seen a Bigfoot, so she referred to it as a critter. Suffice to say the coroner's report did corroborate that the beating to the head had caused a significant brain bleed, which is significant with a bear attack. Needless to say, my cousin spent the first month in America with me. We grew exceptionally close. 
He's a very good man who is incapable of even squashing an ant, which I found out to my peril. He then returned to London to stay in my flat for the remainder of the time, while I finished my cooking course in America, then returned home to London, where I currently reside. I have opened my thriving coffee shop in High Street, Kensington, but I am proud to lay claim to the fact that I am half American, for it is a remarkable, noble land. I also feel privileged to be privy to such a remarkable Bigfoot story, a creature not commonly known by many Brits. So I feel like I'm in on the secret. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night. (laughs) 